Welcome back to the Ask Dave Anything part two of the game industry series. We've split it into two parts, so we'll be going back to the old footage where I answer 10 more questions. Uh, and we've just found that this format where you split it in half works a lot better than if you have a giant 40 minute long video. So uh, hope you enjoy it. Let's just carry on with the questions. Question number 11. I'm interested to know if there's any good ways of learning game design aside from stuff like your videos, which you've already mentioned. Most courses in education in general teaches you programming, but few have seen tell you how to make a good level in systems, etc. Let's let's reiterate again. I think the best way is to self-teach. So you, if you play a lot of games and you understand the game systems and stuff and you understand why you like and didn't like things and what works and what doesn't and what might work for other people but not necessarily for you, that's where all the, that's where you build that library of knowledge and you start learning uh, what makes for good game design versus bad game design. And you're right that most education courses are about teaching you programming. Now they're teaching you programming so that you can go and start experimenting and making your own stuff. But on the other hand, I think that they miss the opportunity to teach core game design, which I think you can learn easier through board games, which is the simplest form of game design um, that anyone can do at any time. Uh, but you know, what, what, what do I know? <laughs> I've applied for teaching jobs in the past and uh, I came close to getting one, but mm, never seemed to work out because I don't have a bachelor's degree. Um, all right, question number 12. How do you get into game design? What courses should you take? Uh, yeah, again, me personally, <laughs> if you're going, if you want to do liter, if you want to do narrative design uh, or things like that, you're studying literature and um, storytelling, things like that. If you want to go into game design, I think it helps to study game theory, which is not about, it's about how people interact when it comes to uh, resources and things like that. Um, but the, uh, the most important one, yeah, I think, is psychology. Um, because having some knowledge of psychology helps you understand the user experience better and how players react to things. And that's that's where you get most of, that's where you get the best sort of uh, game design knowledge. Other than playing games, you just have to play games. You have to play a lot of games. You have to build up that library of knowledge and that's, that's just all there is to it. Uh, question number 13, how bad is ageism? Hiring discrimination based on age. It's not that bad. I've never, never seen a problem. In fact, there's quite, quite a lot. I, I think, I think people have a lot of respect for people who've been the, in the industry for a long time in general. Uh, if it's a very young company, sometimes there might be some ages in there. I guess I've experienced that once or twice in, um, mobile startup studios where they had like a huge hit. Um, out of nowhere and then they have all this funny money lying around and and uh, so they think they know everything and then I come in and go oh wow you guys are doing some garbage here so there's there's that um, but generally I don't think it's that bad I've never seen anyone not be hired because they were too old or anything like that and generally I've had a lot of respect for people who've been in the industry a long time because it's really rare. The majority of people leave before their 10th year in the game industry. So I don't think it's that bad. Maybe it'll get worse over time, but generally there's a lot of veneration for um, people who are older who have survived the game industry as long as they have, um, which is sad, but you know, it's sad in that they, it's a survival thing. I mean, because the game industry is so toxic and, and often terrible for living <laughs> purposes. All right. Question number 14. Do you believe that because making shitty games with horrible monetization methods is so much more profitable, the art of actual good game development is at risk of dying out? No, no, no. It's never at risk of dying out. Uh, simply because the methodology for creating games is becoming so much easier. Unreal 5, which I've been tinkering with lately, is very, very easy to, to learn, in my opinion. Uh, and use and I think it's just it's just getting easier and easier for new people to come in and start game development on their own 
Um, it would be, it would have been like, let's say 15 to 20 years ago, it would have been almost impossible to have as many indie developers as we currently do, simply because there weren't this, there wasn't this access to all these different game engines and things created specifically for the purposes of creating new games like Unity and, and Unreal and even Roblox and things like that. So <clears throat> I think that when the AAA and the big corporations become overly greedy, there's this wave of indie games that come in and sort of usurp the scene and take over again. And so it's it's not a big deal. It, it is a cycle and we've seen it a few times already. And uh, I always, I actually enjoy it. The rise of the indies occurs. All right. Question number 16. I originally wanted to get into CS to eventually, uh, computer sciences, to eventually do work on games, but I have, over the last couple of years, gotten really turned off by the horrific working conditions that seem to be common practice in the AAA gaming industry. Endless crunch, unreasonable deadlines, low pay, etc. Since you have actual experience in the field, do you agree this is the case? Do you think this is going to get better or worse in the future? What should we do to improve these conditions? <clears throat> um, yeah, this is the case. There is been endless crunch, unreasonable deadlines, and low pay. This is particular to, but not exclusive to, America. So I've found in Europe that there's a lot less of the endless crunch and unreasonable deadlines and low pay. And there's a lot more vacation time and other things in Europe. And it's getting better, I think, over time. But I think the only way that it's going to improve in America is if, if you guys unionize. So if you have a union, you guys can go on strike and shut down the process for creating a game for months. And that is deadly to them. That is deadly to a game studio. So um, you guys have the power. You just need to unionize and use that power to go, hey, if you're not paying us a living wage and you're making us work all this overtime for no extra pay, why are we even working here in the first place? Until you stand up against these conditions, it's not going to change, especially in America, where they have so much corporate uh, control of the government. So unionize. That's the, the best thing you could possibly do. Support unions. And when you see people talking about unionizing in the game industry, show your support for them and, and so forth. And eventually, I think we can improve conditions in America. Otherwise, I would say flee America as soon as you can. Uh, work at European studios. Believe it or not, mobile game studios tend to have the best working conditions, just in my personal experience. Um, they tend to do a lot more good work-life balance, and it's because they have so much money coming in from one or two games that just go gangbusters and have you know millions of people playing them and, and, and being monetized. So, um, yeah. <laughs> if, work, if the working conditions are the most important aspect to you, I would look at uh, either Scandinavian or European companies uh, before definitely stay away from America. <laughs> uh, ouch. <clears throat> Question 16. I'm thinking of applying for a summer internship as a game designer. I'm currently in my third year at college and I don't really have a lot of interesting projects to show on my CV or cover letter. Uh, I'm kind of insecure about this and I fear not being able to be of use even if I get accepted. Is the game designer position really demanding? Should I work on some cool side projects before applying? For now I have checked Blizzard, Rare, Amazon Games, and Dreamhaven. Any insight on them? lot of questions in that one um <clears throat> so uh if you don't if you have any interesting projects to show and um and you're still in college you're already doing better than the majority i would think um i wouldn't uh, you know fear is the mind killer so <laughs> try not to be fearful uh, just apply to these jobs and, and, and see see what you get. Um, I would say that, you know, since it would be your first job, applying for associate designer and things like that would be better. Um, and, and maybe try your hand at level design. I don't know if you have any skills in that regard. Um, it doesn't hurt to work on some cool side projects before you apply, but there's no reason not to apply and then just apply again later when you have more to show. Um, and in fact, that's my message to everyone in this regard is just apply to every job that you want. And um, if you don't get it, whatever, just move on. The people put too much um, emphasis onto that one job that, oh, I really want this one job and oh, I'm going to apply for this one job. And they put all their hopes into this one job and then they don't get it. And they're like, oh, my dreams are crashed. Ah, I suck, blah, blah, blah. And they, they completely lose their nerve and like they go and they do something else. You can't think of it that way. 
you know, I've been in the game industry for 24 years. I have a massive resume of like a crazy games and stuff. I still get rejected from jobs all the time. It's not a big deal. Sometimes you're just not a fit for whatever it is they're in particular looking for. Don't take that as a sign to never apply for another job again. You should use the shotgun method for applying for jobs. Um, go to websites that aggregate all the different game studios, ones you've never even heard of, and just throw your resume at all of them and see what see what bounces back. And if it doesn't work out that time, like look, maybe you get some feedback and use that feedback to improve your resume. Or, you know, you talk to someone like me and I'll look through your, your stuff and I'll give you an honest opinion on, on what's going on. Um, but yeah, don't, don't put all your stock and hope into one or two studios. Just shock and apply to everything in your area first, you know? If you don't have to move, it's less of a hardship on you. Um, and it's easier for them to accept you. So, for example, I applied to Blizzard, um, who, which was in Irvine, while I was in Irvine. That's part of the reason that I got the job is because it was just a few, it was like less than 20 minutes down the street from me and I could just go do an interview and, and work there without having to pick up my whole life and move it somewhere. That is the most valuable thing to those companies because they know that they don't have to worry about the moving expenses and all that other stuff, especially for a low level entry position. So it helps to live in the area for the jobs that you want. Um, and uh, game dev map is something that you should look at. And so you can sort of see what game studios are in your area and what you should be applying to and just shock and apply to all of them, anything around you. Um, <clears throat> do I have any insight into Blizzard, Rare, Amazon Games, and Dreamhaven? Um, no. <laughs> uh, Blizzard, basically, it's a one in a thousand shot right off the bat, just because they get so many applications. Um, Amazon Games, I wouldn't want to work at anyways. Rare, I have no insight into at all. Dreamhaven is not a game studio. Dreamhaven is an umbrella corp for other game studios. So you'd be applying not to Dreamhaven, you would probably be applying to one of the game studios at Dreamhaven. So there you go. Uh, question 17, what's the game industry like in a country like Thailand? Uh, not very big. There's really not a lot of studios here and the majority of them are not English speaking. So in order to have a studio in Thailand at all, you have to hire three Thai people to every one uh, English speaker, uh, if it's a foreign studio. Um, and the problem with that is that there's not a lot of people who know much about game development in Thailand. Uh, that's actually something that I'm working on to change. Uh, I would like to start a game development school here. Um, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen anytime in the near future, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, and then on top of all that, the few studios that I've seen that are English speaking and hiring foreigners uh, in Thailand are totally toxic in horrible places to work. You would never want to work at these studios. In fact, uh, one of them is the worst studio I have ever worked at in my entire life. And that's saying a lot. Um, yeah. That's the one. Avoid at all costs. Question number 18. How was working with game design and QA different between the companies? Was it noticeable how different companies would value QA testing? Yes, it is vastly different between studios. And uh, it, it can be disheartening at, at some studios how they treat QA. I think it's improving over time. And again, I encourage everyone to unionize so that you can prevent mistreatment. But Blizzard was a rarity, especially at the time that I worked there and that they really valued the feedback from QA and actually listened and actually hired from QA periodically. So if someone in QA showed skill with the level editor, they would, I mean, that's how I got promoted to level design. So at other studios, all sorts of negativity towards QA, and it's really unfair and, and pretty lame. But if you're going to do an entry level job into the game industry through QA, and I would look into how they treat that QA department, talk to the people who work there already and, and, and see what sort of things you hear. If it seems particularly toxic, maybe use it as an entry point to get into QA, but then once you feel like you've developed enough knowledge base of the user experience and like how you're going to do level design or game design or how you're going to approach that look for other studios to work at because 
if the the treatment of QA there, if there's no methodology to get into the game development teams, if there's if it's kind of a toxic environment, just move on to a different studio. Never put your stock into a studio. That is to say, don't be committed to one studio that you just happen to be working at because they will treat you like garbage. The, the, the moment they can make a profit off of laying you off, that's what they'll do. So never, never make the company your home. It's not, it's not your home. They don't, they're not going to treat you better just because you're loyal. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Question number 19, what do you think happens to big game companies who do not agree to ride the work politics train? Oh, woke. Oh, Jesus Christ. Question 19. What do you think happens to big game companies who do not agree to ride the woke politics train? To me, it seems that they get way more negative community backlash rather than good publicity on the market if they ride it. Is it the case that the woke community has a more consumer mindset, which is more likely to spend more money in the cash shop? No. I have a lot of feelings about this sort of question. Um, woke politics is sort of a dog whistle for there are things in games that I don't like. However you want to see it, the normalization of things like trans and LGBT and various other people that are just human beings, you know, they're going to make more appearances in games over time. And we just need to accept that because it's okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like who cares if your favorite character is gay or not? Like it, it doesn't matter. And I agree that they may overemphasize these things in order to go, Hey, look at us. We're doing this thing. They don't need to do that. They should stop doing that. If a character is gay and it happens to come up in the lore and stuff, fine. That's good. That's representation. That's how it should be. And people just need to get over it in terms of like, you don't need to overemphasize it. You should have it because these people exist and they are human beings and they should exist in these different game worlds. That's just how life is. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe this is a bad take. I'm not sure. Uh, but I don't think that there's anything about the woke community that has a more consumer mindset or anything like that. And these big game companies who don't ride the woke politics train, whatever that means, really, it's really just about having representation. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that because that is how the world works. And uh, people who are super against that need to get over themselves and, and recognize that there are people who are different from them who exist and just who cares, leave it alone. Like <laughs> it's not a big deal. And the people who are overemphasizing it also need to calm down a little bit and, and recognize that by overemphasizing that, oh, this character is trans and that's very important. You are maybe doing harm to the cause in terms of if you bring attention to something and you make it a big deal, it's, it comes off as both disingenuous and it attracts attention to the wrong thing about a character. You want the character to be cool and fun and, you know, maybe they're doing heroic stuff and they just happen to be also trans and that's part of their identity and maybe it comes up or maybe it doesn't, but it's there. And that's, that's the important part of representation that people don't seem to get. And that's, so as a storyteller myself, that's the thing that I try to emphasize, um, like in my stories, if there is a, a character who is uh, LGBTQ or whatever, I don't make that the most important thing about them because it's not, they're just human beings. The most important thing is their actions and how they behave and how they treat others and things like that. And that's what I try to emphasize in my stories. And maybe it comes up or maybe it doesn't, but the other aspects of them are there. And I don't want to overemphasize it because it can bring a negative form of attention to that. Because then I'm saying they're special because of this. And that's not the case. They're special because of who they are and what they do. And they also happen to be a representative of some uh, minority. Does that make sense? I don't know. If, uh, if it doesn't make sense, flame me. Uh, maybe I deserve it. Question number 20, referring to my work specifics file. Oh, uh, Hey Dave, how would an indie dev go about writing up something similar to what you have here? Oh, 
shit. My mind broke. Ah, okay. Referring to the work specifics file. So I have the work specifics file that lists all the very specific things I've done. Um, this is something that I generate whenever I'm working in a studio, or at least I used to. And I would just, anytime I worked on something, I would write it down in the list and go, ah, I did this thing, I did this thing, I did this thing. I did this for two reasons. One was so that I would remember because memory goes. <laughs> and I just wanted to have a list of things that I had done. Uh, uh, two, it also helps when you're doing reviews, meaning like internal reviews for promotions and things like that so that you have a very specific list of everything that you've done. That way they can't bullshit you and pretend that you didn't do anything. Uh, so I recommend if whatever job you're working at, literally any job, whenever you do something that you think is an accomplishment or worthy of, of uh, recording, write it down. And write down specifics about it, and specifically what you were proud of and, and what you achieved and, and why you think it was above and beyond your normal job. Anyways, how would an indie dev go about writing up something similar to what I've done with my work specifics, uh, namely when most of the code and design is done by them? My jerk response would be to pick achievements that you're proud of and list them, but picking a few things here and there never really jive with me. Any advice? I think if you've created a whole game, you don't need to do a work specifics file. The reason that I have the work specifics file is because I was a cog in a machine, effectively. I, I was one person in a team of 30 to 200 people. And so in order to sort of justify my existence, I wanted to have that list of things. You know, I was very insecure back then in my first uh, five years. <laughs> so I, if you've created a whole game, you don't need a work specifics file. It's not even something that I use when I apply to jobs. It's something I maintain for myself. So don't worry about it. You've got, if you've got games to show, just let them play the games and then they can ask you questions about it and it'll be very obvious that you created it. But most importantly, that game experience just needs to be fun. So yeah, in terms of like applying to jobs, you don't need a work specifics file. It, it is really just for personal use. And all you really need is a resume and then like the body of work and a way to display that, such as a website where it's very easy to get the things and play them so that people can experience what you've created. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you have any questions for game studios or games, you can feel free to send me questions about any of the games that I've worked on or any of the game studios that I've worked at. I've got a few more slots for that and then I can start those. Um, anyways, I hope you enjoyed this next part in the series. I'm going to split this into two parts. I, I hope you enjoy it. Remember, I'm not shy. I'll tell you the truth. <laughs>